Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, yeah, folks, it is Monday. I am Grimnir, and this is the Grim Leftovers program. Uh, right now, it is August 19th, 2019, Monday afternoon, evening, depending on where you may be. Could be morning, I don't know. But right here where I am, in the middle of New Mexico, the heart of New Mexico, it's evening, 5 o'clock. So, uh, yeah, 7 p.m. on the East Coast time, that's when we start here on the Grim Leftovers show. And I want to welcome and thank everybody for tuning in this evening and all the various spots you tune in from, whether that be uh, right here on Real Liberty Media, Real Liberty Media dot com rlmradio.xyz freedomsnetwork.com real liberty dot org maybe on our tune in site maybe internet radio maybe on shoutcast.com yeah you can listen there too uh if you saw the tweets or you saw the messages over on minds.com welcome welcome to the show come on over to real liberty media.com jump on into the chat and Chat with all the folks that are here this evening and say hi and howdy. Maybe comment on some of the stories that I cover throughout the show. I got a bunch of stories lined up, as I always do. But uh, let me first, before I go on, uh, say hi and howdy to all the folks here in uh, the chat this this evening. Uh, the bots and uh, bodies, as Flash likes to say. <laughs> And if you're not actually here, if you're maybe out there in the wilderness, in the distance, listening. Hi to you folks out there. But here in the chat, we got the barman. He's my bot. We got Mr. Beetle and uh, myself and the Moose Girl listed here as well. The wonderful Miss Kate. Uh, DC in the brackets there. Anti. Asmodeus. Chalcedony. I. B. Don. C. Uh, the Java Doctor. Mr. Romes. The Vanna White Bot. Mr. Vin E. Vincent Easley the two. Vincent Easley two or the second. Junior. <laughs> we got weather dork bot give you your weather at this current day. And I checked mine recently there and it's it's hot out there, let me tell you. It is hot. We got the Phantom. We got Miss Circle and uh, the Cyborg Doodle. We got M Siv and Flash Somebody and Frumpy and Grams and Grummet and Huh? Ha. Huh. <laughs> JJ's and uh, Kiss, Mr. Snick, uh, the uh, Ponder Gander. Uh, we got the Poopster and Prince. Now, a little show note here. Uh, I don't know if it's this Thursday or next Thursday or what Thursday it's going to start, but uh, either this Thursday or next Thursday at 11 p.m. Eastern, we'll be starting a new show, the Poopster and Prince Power Hour right here on RLM Radio. So look forward to that. Be sure and tune in 11 p.m. Eastern on Thursday evenings coming up. Uh, we got the Pone Sauce and the lovely Miss Van Meter here as well. So welcome to you all and who all, who all ever may be out there in the various other places. Ah, always good to have you here with us. So I got a bunch of stories lined up, like I said, I always do. This, by the way, is episode 35 of the Grim Leftovers program. It's the 34th week of 2019, and we're on episode 35. So here we go, here we go, here we go. Warm, it's warm out there. I checked my weather, it was around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Vinny sitting at 95. I would imagine Meisterbrow down there in the heat of Tucson, Arizona is probably much hotter uh, than all of us. But let me guarantee you, let me tell you, let me assure you that this is not the hottest month ever on record. Neither was last month or the month before. Uh, despite what you may have heard, what you probably heard that after just in the, the beginning of July, they said June was the hottest record or the hottest month ever recorded. And then just a couple of days into August, July was the hottest month ever recorded. Nonsense. <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to start off with a story here from 2015, posted on New American, the New American.com, by a guy named Alex Newman. July, warmest on record, lie debunked by NASA's own data. Yeah. So uh, back then, it wasn't the Trumpster, it was the Obama, the Obama. Obama your ass. Anyway, uh, the Obama administration's politicized bureaucracies are trying to deceive the world once again. This time claiming falsely that July of 2015 was the warmest on record. In the real world, it was not even the hottest July since last year, according to Global Satellite Temperature Record, which is considered more reliable. Uh, where, 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 I lost my spot there. <laughs> oh, more reliable and comprehensive than the admittedly manipulated and incomplete data relied on by NASA and the NOAA to make their latest false warmest on record pronouncements. Virtually none of the establishment press bothered to mention the caveats on the methodology behind taking the Earth's temperature, preferring instead to parrot official releases yet again. Yet again. Indeed, as has happened in virtually every instance where the uh, National uh, NASA and uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, made a warmest on record claim, whether it be over a time span of a year or a month, the agency's own data contradicts the claim. In fact, the global temperature data gathered by NASA's own satellites and remote sensing systems, RSS, data set, along with the satellite data from the University of Alabama at Huntsville, UAH, make a complete mockery of their latest fear-mongering, just as they did for claims they made about last August and the year 2014. Better data shows July this year as uh, is the hottest since way back in, oh, 2014. It's not 4,000 years. It's not 135 years. It's not the hottest July since the last one, noted popular Australian climate researcher and scientist Joe Nova in an analysis ridiculing the official claims and even more outlandish media propaganda surrounding them. We only have 30 years, 30 years of good climate data. The satellites tell us the pause is real, and last month's summer, summer temperatures is not a record anything. According to the UAH and RSS Global Satellites, lower troposphere averages for July 2014 were 0.3 degrees C and 0.34 degrees C compared to July 2015 of 0.28 C. Even June 2015 was hotter. July 2015 is not even the hottest month since June. Oops. <laughs> As usual, the cascade of alarmist headlines worldwide about the allegedly record-setting July, some especially silly journalists speculated that it may have been the hottest in 4,000 years. Uh, it began with a press releases from the alleged scientists at NOAA and NASA. Instead of focusing on the fact that their own satellites show that the ongoing pause in global warming has been going for more than two decades, or that even this June and last July were warmer than July of 2015, the tax-funded alarmists cherry-picked, dubious, incomplete, massaged, and in some cases, completely invented data to falsely claim their new record was set last month. The July averages temperature across global land and ocean surfaces was 1.46 degrees F above the 20th century average. NOAA said in its deceptive press release, 
as July is climatologically, climatologically the warmest month for the year. This was also the all-time highest month te monthly temperature in the 1880 through 2015 record at 61.86 degrees Fahrenheit, surpassing the previous record set in 1998 by 0 0.14 degrees F. It also claimed that the land surface temperatures in July were the sixth highest on record and that much of the alleged record was driven by warmth in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. NOAA's Global Summary Information press release did not bother to mention, however, the powerful but natural El Nino driving, uh, driving ocean temperatures. Critics tore through the claims uh, apart from all angles, using a number of fascinating graphs and images created with the U.S. government's own temperature data. Independent climate analysis Stephen Goddard at Real Climate Science demolished the official claims and lambasted the criminals behind them. July was either the 8th or ninth warmest since 1979, <laughs> not not even close to the hottest month ever, as the criminals at NOAA claim, he observed. Global warming theory demands that lower troposphere warms faster than the surfaces, the exact opposite of the fraudulent claims being made by the NOAA. The level of fraud on display here is off the scale. July was nowhere near the hottest month. Among other data cited by Goddard is the fact that the percentage of days over 100 degrees in the U.S. of A has plummeted since the 1930s. Again, using the U.S. government's own data, he showed that the average summer maximum temperature has also plummeted with summer 2015 more than 4 degrees cooler than in 1936. Across the United States, July was just the 51st hottest since 1895, according to U.S. government temperature data. Despite major fact errors by journalists, <laughs> if that's what you want to call them. <laughs> oh, man. I, anyway, I'll, I'll let you get, carry on read the rest of this yourself. Just bear in mind, this is from 2015. 2015. Why do I bring this up? Why am I bringing up such old information? Because once again, at the beginning of last month, or the beginning of this month, I should say, because this is now August. So at the beginning of this month came out this report. July 9, 2019 <laughs> was the hottest ever on record. <laughs> Just as they said the month prior about June. Uh, so here it is from What's Up With That, posted on uh, August 2nd here by Roy Spencer, Ph.D. July 2019 was not the warmest on record. July 2019 was probably the fourth warmest of the last 41 years. Global reanalysis data sets need to start being used for monitoring global surface temperatures. We are now seeing reports from CNN, BBC, Reuters, all of the clap outlets that July 2019 was the hottest month on record for global average surface temperatures. One would think that the very best data would be used to make this assessment. After all, it comes from official government sources, such as NOAA and the World Meteorological Association, the WMO, but currently, official pronouncements of global temperature records come from a fairly limited and error-prone array of thermometers which were never intended to measure global temperature trends. The Global Surface Thermometer Network has three major problems when it comes to getting global average temperatures. The Urban Heat Island, the UHI, effect has caused a gradual warming of most land thermometer sites due to encroachment of buildings, parking lots, 
air conditioning units, vehicles, etc. These effects are localized, not indicative of the most of the global land surface, which re most remains rural, rural. No parking lots out there. No air conditioners out there. <laughs> and not caused by increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because UHI warming looks like global warming, it is difficult to remove from the data. In fact, NOAA's efforts to make the UHI contaminated data look like rural data seems to have had the opposite effect. Yes, indeed. The best strategy would be to simply use only the best, most rural sighted thermometers. That is currently not done. Hey, Christine, welcome. Um, ocean temperatures, number two, ocean temperatures are notoriously uncertain due to changing temperature measurement technologies. Canvas buckets thrown overboard to get sea surface temperatures. Uh, sample a long ago. Uh, ship engine water intake temperatures, more recently, buoys, satellite measurements only since about 1983, etc., so on, so forth. Both land and ocean temperatures are notoriously incomplete geographically. How does one estimate temperatures in a one million square mile area where no measurements exist? Huh? Huh? How does that happen? <laughs> There is a better way. Of course there is. A more accurate, more realistic way. But that doesn't really help out the agenda now, does it? A more complete picture. Global reanalysis data sets. Uh, various weather forecast centers around the world have experts who take a wide variety of data from many sources and figure out which ones have information about the weather and which ones don't. But how can they know the difference? Because the good data, uh, good data produce good weather forecast, bad data don't. The data sources include surface thermometers, buoys, and ships, as do the official global temperature calculations, but they also add in weather balloons, commercial aircraft data, and a wide variety of satellite data sources. Huh, hmm, imagine that. Some better data, wow. Why would one use non-surface data to get better surface temperature measurements? Since surface weather uh, affects weather conditions higher in the atmosphere and vice versa, one can get better estimate of global average surface temperature if you have satellite measurements of upper air temperatures on a global basis and in regions where no surface data exists. Knowing whether there is a warm or cold air mass there from satellite data is better than knowing nothing at all. Furthermore, weather systems move. And this is the beauty of reanalysis data set. All of the various data sources have been thoroughly researched to see what mixture of them provide the best weather forecasts, including adjustments for possible instrumental biases and drifts over time. We know that the physical consistency of the various data inputs is, was also optimized. Part of the process is making forecasts to get data where no data exists, because weather systems continuously move around the world. The equations of motion, thermodynamics, and moisture can be used to estimate temperatures where no data exists by doing a physics extrapolation using data observed on one day in one area, then watching how those atmospheric characteristics are carried into an area with no data on the next day. This is how we knew we were going to be exceeding some hot days in France recently. The hot Saharan air layer was forecast to move from the Sahara Desert into Western Europe. Uh, this kind of physics-based extrapolation, which is what weather forecasting should be, is, it says, but should be, uh, is much more realistic than, for example, using land surface temperatures in July around the Arctic Ocean to simply guess temperatures out over the cold ocean 
uh, water and ice where summer temperatures seldom rise much above freezing. This is, this is actually one of the questionable today, techniques used by NASA GISS uh, to get temperature estimates where no data exists. If you think the reanalysis technique sounds suspect, once again, I point out it is used for your daily weather forecast. We like to make fun of how poor some weather forecasts can be, usually are, but the objective evidence is that forecasts out two to three days are pretty accurate and continue to improve over time. The reanalysis picture for July 2019 uh, the only reanalysis data I'm aware of is that is available in near real time to the public is from weatherbell.com uh, and comes from NOAA's Climate Forecast System version 2, uh, or CFSV2. The, the, the plot of surface temperature departures from 1981 through 2010, mean 19, shows a global average warmth of just over... 0 0.3 degrees C or half a degree Fahrenheit above normal. Note that from the uh, figure, and there's a cool little image in here that you can take a look at, uh, that, that from the image, how distorted the news reporting was concerning the temporary hot spells in France with the media reports uh, said contributed to global average warmth. Yes, it was unusually warm in France in July, but look at how how cold it is in Eastern Europe and Western Russia. Uh, where, where was that reporting on that? Missing, totally absent. How about the fact that the United States was on average below normal, where most of you are sitting and listening? The CFSV2 reanalysis data set goes back only to July, uh, only to 1979. And from it, we find that July 2019 was actually cooler than three other Julys from 2016, 2002, and 2017, and so was the fourth warmest in 41 years, and being only half a degree Fahrenheit above average, yeah, I'm not really alarmed. <laughs> Why don't the people who track global temperatures use reanalysis data set? Uh, the, the main limitation on with the reanalysis data sets is that most only go back to 1979, and I believe that it, uh, at least one goes back to the 1950s, since people who monitor global temperature trends want data as far back as possible, at least 1900 or before, they can legitimately say they want to construct their own data sets from the longest record of data from surface thermometers. <sighs> But most warming, arguably, occurred in the last 50, 50 years. And if one is trying to tie global temperature to greenhouse gas emissions, the period since 1979, the last 40 plus years, seems sufficient since that is the period with the greatest greenhouse gas emissions, or what they're calling greenhouse gas emissions, which are not greenhouse gas emissions, since carbon dioxide is not a greenhouse gas, since... Greenhouse gases don't actually exist. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, oh, and so the warming should be observed. So I suggest a global reanalysis data set be used to give a more accurate estimate of the global of changes in global temperature for the purposes of monitoring warming trends over the last 40 years. Yeah, the real problem though is there are no warming trends over the last 40 years. Yeah, it's not warming. It's a myth. It's a hoax. It's a lie. Oh, lies. Yes. <laughs> yeah, would they lie? Yes. Yes, they would. Again, from newamerican.com. I'll post it on uh, June 26th there of uh, this year by a guy named James Murphy. Climate alarmists caught red-handed manipulating temperature data yet again yet a freaking again a belief in catastrophic man-made global warming should hinge on a couple of key factors first it must be shown that in the recent past the earth was a cooler place 
Second, temperatures in the present and in the future must show dramatic increase in times of increased carbon dioxide. These facts would supply evidence that scientists could use, would use, to show that our planet is getting quickly warmer. Such a graph would look much like a hockey stick. Yes, it would. But the weather just doesn't cooperate with the climate alarmist version of events. And when temperatures don't cooperate with climate hysteria, too often we find climate alarmists making up information, faking the data. Yes, indeed, Michael Manmade's hockey stick data. Yes, indeed. <laughs> history, even recent history, gets changed to reflect what should be happening according to those, quote, in the know, unquote. Geologist Tony Hiller, however, isn't one to rely on what the mainstream media and the climate scientists tell us is happening. Being a scientist, Heller is keen on reporting facts, actual information, true data, instead of hysteria. And Heller is telling us that global temperature data is being manipulated before our very eyes. According to Heller, NASA has manipulated historical temperature data to show a dramatic increase in temperature, especially since the year 2000. Comparing NASA charts from 2000, 2017, and 2019, Heller shows data has been manipulated multiple times since the year 2000. Heller shows with NASA's own data that the space agency has been adjusting temperatures from the past. Temperatures from as long as go as the mid-1800s downward, while adjusting current day temperatures upward. And those changes are responsible for most of the claimed global warming during that time. In the year 2000, historical data showed a 0.5 degree Celsius increase from the mid-1800s to the year 2000. In 2017, the same agency's historical temperature data showed a 1.5 degree C increase, and just two years later, a 2.0 degree, uh, degree C increase. In each of those time frames, older temperatures are pushed slightly downward. The 2017 to 2019 rise in temperature is especially confusing when you add the fact that satellite temperature data shows a global decrease in land temperature for the last two years, as well as, as well, satellite data to, adds to the case of fraud in another way. According to the satellite data since the year 2000, land temperatures have only increased by 0.2 degrees Celsius, but NASA's latest chart says that temperatures increased by 1.5 degrees Celsius since 2000. So more than 80% of the change in temperature since the year 2000 is the result of temperature data manipulation. They're lying. They're faking the data. They've quadrupled warming, mainly by cooling past temperatures and warming present temperatures. Heller said in a video released. Moreover, the entire medieval warm period has disappeared. Magic, poof, gone. The medieval warm period, which has lots of scientific and horse historical evidence to show that it happened, and which was prominent in a 1990 IPCC graph, has been adjusted out of existence. Gone. Climate alarmists cannot have a medieval warm period since it casts so much doubt on the current theory that man is causing an upward temperature swing. The medieval warm period occurred before man could, be, uh, could reasonably be blamed for it. That's why in 1999, when Michael Mann released his infamous hockey stick graph, the medieval warm period was suddenly missing, gone, kaput. 
Thus, did man create a non-existent global warming tipping point based on CO2 starting late in the 19th century? If we had temperatures when CO2 was low, that would indicate that other factors in the climate are much stronger than carbon dioxide, Heller pointed out. The CO2 tipping point farce, lie, goes well beyond Michael Mann's skullduggery. In 2006, statement by Dr. David Deming revealed that as early as 1995, scientists were facing pressure to get rid of the medieval warming period. I had another interesting experience around uh, the time of my paper in Science was published. I received an astonishing email from a major researcher in the area of climate change, he said. We have to get rid of the medieval warming period, Deming told the U.S. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Interesting note. <laughs> when you click on the link to Deming's 2002 testimony, you will get page cannot be found. Question. Has it been purged? <laughs> and if so, why? When you're willing to manipulate data, you can show any result you want. And they wanted to show warming, Heller concluded. Uh, British economist Ro Ro Ronald Coase once quipped, Torture the data, and it will confess to anything. While Coase, while Coase quote about economics uh, and definitely applies to natural science as well, as Heller's well-researched charts show, today's climate alarm alarmist scientists are more than willing to torture the data to achieve their desired results. There are several examples of doctored historical temperature data. Besides NASA, we know that the NOAA has done it. We know that HADCRUT4 data used by the UNIPCC contained at least 70 obvious errors. According to a 2018 audit by climate data researcher, Dr. John McLean. And while the data tampering isn't limited to temperature either, sea level rise data is tampered with as well. Uh, the willingness of scientists such as man, uh, scientists, yeah, that, that, that's a loosely applied word, such as man and others to completely change historical data to show rapid warming is scientific quackery of the highest order. And that willingness doesn't just make them bad scientists, it makes them liars. <laughs> liars of the worst possible kind. And, and why, you, you may ask, what do I care? Why do I harp on this global warming climate change nonsense so much? Because this is the one thing, the one thing they can use to control pretty much every aspect of your life. Whether it be your, your, your financials, the food that you eat, the kind of the way that you live in your home, uh, the type of vehicles that you're going to drive, everything can be controlled through this climate alarmist nonsense. And it's being pushed out there and it's being pushed hard. And most people believe it because it is so much everywhere. It, it, it just totally blankets everything. And, and so people believe it. So many people believe it. Try and tell somebody that the climate change alarmists are, are hoaxers and making making stuff up lies and they, they will start calling you names and making fun of you and pointing their finger and laughing like, oh, he's one of those deniers. He doesn't believe the scientists. Uh. <laughs> so I, I, I have to harp on this stuff because it's huge. It's a monster. It, 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 is, it is just out of control and uh yeah, so there's that. All right, now we move on to something of a different area of the world, but still talking about lying liars that lie. And this was posted on July 20th over here on DailyMail.com. One of the clap outlets. 
one of the corporate lame ass propaganda outlets posted this uh, and, I, and I found it a little hard to believe that it's there but it is hey Dan how you doing down there all right so anyway um, here it is I just made it up Florida Dem admits lying about treating pulse shooting victims after going on the record as saying I personally removed 77 bullets from 32 people it was like an assembly line <laughs> Elizabeth McCarthy told the Florida Department of Health that she had fabricated claims that she was a cardiologist who had treated victims. I lied. It was a false statement. I just made it up, McCarthy said, according to an affidavit, affidavit released Wednesday of that week. The department charged her with violating state law under the unlicensed activity statutes. On Wednesday, she was served with a cease and desist order, which would prohibit her from telling anyone else that she was a medical doctor. <laughs> oh, I, and I, I'm not even going to go into the story for you. All you got to know, all you got to know about this is that, the, the, those little bullet points that I just shared with you, that's all you need to know. These people lied. They lied hard. And they made up stuff. We never saw bodies being carried out of out of Pulse nightclub. It was all faked. I don't think anybody actually died there at Pulse nightclub. Maybe they did. The government has no problem going in and shooting a bunch of people in order to uh, prove their agenda, push their agenda, uh, to, to get things done how they want them to. And they do it all the time. And I'm not going to necessarily point out Sandy Hoax or the Boston Marathon false flag event, but yeah, those, those are a couple of them. Uh, anyway, so that, that's all you really need to know is that they admit the doctors, quote, unquote, doctors, who are not actually doctors, saying they uh, removed 77 bullets from 32 people were lying. Freaking lying. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, everybody's an engineer. We all drive trains. All right. Um, <laughs> from RT.com, Russia Today, on the uh, 15th of July, U.S. draft bill seeks to ban big tech from taking over economy with private cryptocurrencies cuz you know you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to take over the the fake the, the the fiat debt notes that that are called US dollars even though they're not dollars they're debt notes <laughs> but they're called dollars everybody accepts accepts them as dollars you can take them somewhere and trade them out for products services so they're considered money although they're not money. But now there, there's a fear that, hey, wait, these guys are going to steal a little bit from our game, from our, from, our, from our big fiat game, because, oh, people could trade these cryptocurrencies for products and services, just like they can trade our, our fake money for products and services. That's not going to help us. We, can't, we have no control over that. You can't even legally tax that unless they convert it back to fiat dollars. <laughs> but if they find a way to never have to, try to to convert those cryptos back to fiat currency, then we have no control. Fearing the impact by a popular privately issued cryptocurrency might have on both the American and dollar dominant global economy, U.S. lawmakers are drafting a bill to prevent tech giants from taking over the financial sector. The bill titled, Keep Big Tech Out of Finance Act. Don't they realize big tech's been in finance all along? Anyway, seeks to prohibit any tech company with annual global revenue of more than $25 billion from issuing their own cryptocurrency. 
the draft expi- explicitly bans large platform utilities from being financial institutions or being affiliated with a person that is a financial institution. So in that, large platform utilities means they would have to consider, and I, I'm sure they're, they're talking about Facebook here, Facebook in the Libra phony cryptocurrency that they're talking about, the, they're considering Facebook a utility. Is that interesting or what? Anyway, um, <laughs> any entity that violates the provisions of one bill could be subject to a daily fine of up to $1 million. Just like Dr. Evil. <laughs> what? What? Of course, if the value of the dollar drops to a point like it did over there in Zimbabwe, heh, here's your million dollars. Go buy an apple. <laughs> While the draft legislation does not name any particular companies or digital currencies, the Trumpster singled out Bitcoin, which you can't really single out Bitcoin because, well, Bitcoin doesn't fit your qualifications. And Facebook's yet-to-be-launched Libra in an attack on alternate uh, payment systems last week. The president demanded harsher, harsher federal regulations for peer-to-peer financial transactions. Peer-to-peer. That means not going through that central authority. Facebook, which hopes to use its massive platform to launch Libra sometime next year, is facing an uphill battle with lawmakers and the Federal Reserve which seems set on preventing the firm from becoming a dominant financial player. You're cutting into our profit margins there, boys. This cannot be allowed. This week, the social media giant will face a grilling, which already happened, of course, from the Senate Banking and House Financial Services Committees about the consequences of Libra's launch, including privacy, money laundering, and consumer protection issues. Not that the government or the Federal Reserve wants you to have any privacy or consumer protections, and not that their money's not already heavily used uh, in money laundering. (laughs) They just don't want anybody else getting in on their shell game. (laughs) Hmm. No, they don't. All right, so uh, not this last weekend, but the weekend before, there were a couple what is titled mass shootings, Uh, one down there in El Paso, Texas, and uh, one up there in, uh, where where did Trump say it was, Toledo? (laughs) Dayton? Uh, Anyway, (laughs) Anyway, um, and so there was like, what, 28, 30 people killed there uh, altogether? And overall, throughout the year 2019, or if you want to go back to the August of 2018, or go back five years, uh, four years maybe, four years, go back four years, and figure out how many people have been killed by these, quote, mass shooters, unquote, and just, just, just shriek in horror at what's going on. These mass shooters are, are killing people, even if not all of them were real, even if some of them maybe many of them, maybe most of them, were uh, in fact created and lied about. The numbers themselves do not lie. Police in America have killed 12.8 times more citizens than mass shooters in just the last four years. Yep. This is posted by Matt Agarist on the freethoughtproject.com website on July 15th. Tragically, in America, mass shootings in which murdering psychopaths go on rampages in public spaces have claimed the lives of 339 people since 2015, 
While this number is certainly shocking and far too high, during the same time frame, police in America have claimed the lives of 4,355 citizens, well over 4,000 more. While some of these citizens were armed and dangerous, others were innocent, unarmed, and include small children. Daniel Shaver was one of these people whose life was brought to a screeching halt as he begged for his life on his knees for the police not to kill him. Despite being innocent and unarmed, this father of three was murdered in cold blood by Philip Brailsford, who was never held accountable and allowed to retire from the police force with his full pension. Jeremy Martis was another one of these citizens who was gunned down in cold blood by two killer cops. Martis was just six years old when he was murdered by these killer cops, one of whom was released last month after serving less than two years for his role in this innocent child's death. The list goes on, yet despite its increasing length, most American citizens think that reigning, uh, reigning in America's deadly police problem is somehow unpatriotic or un-American, instead of uh, the, the right realizing that the threat to freedom caused by cops who can kill thousands with impunity, they blame the left. Instead of the left realizing that the threat to freedom caused by cops who kill with impunity, most of them blame guns. The result of this complacency and failure to address the problem has been less freedom and more gun grabs. Sadly, most people who call for gun control fail to realize what that actually means. Only the government has the guns. And if the above numbers are any indicator of what w that would mean, it would be horrific. Every time a lunatic, who is usually on some form of mind-altering pharmaceutical, goes on a shooting rampage, the do-gooders in Washington, with the aid of their citizen flocks, take to the TV and the internet to call for disarming you, the American people. The citizens who call for themselves uh, and their neighbors to be disarmed likely think no deeper than the shallow speeches given by the political blowhards designed to appeal to emotion only. They do not think of what happens during and after the government attempts to remove guns from society. They also completely ignore the fact that criminals don't care about the freaking laws. They, <laughs> and making guns illegal would have zero effect on criminals possessing guns. In the perfect statist world, in which only the government has guns, we're told that crime rates would plummet. People would never be murdered again. Gun violence would be brought to its knees, and the disarmed heaven on earth would ensue. Oh, yes. But how effective would disarming the citizens actually be at preventing gun violence while at the same time keeping guns in the hands of government? One simple way to determine the outcome uh, to look, is to look at the above numbers and compare mass shootings in America with those killed by police. It is entirely too easy to compare all senseless murders carried out by the state to those carried out by citizens. So we will zoom in with a microscope. However, just as a point of reference, in the 20th century alone, governments were responsible for 260 million deaths worldwide. That's right, 260 million deaths by governments worldwide. That number is greater than all the deaths from illicit drugs, uh, STDs, homicides, and traffic accidents combined. Uh, now on to the micro comparison. 
According to a comprehensive database of all American mass shootings that have taken place since 2015, constructed by Mother Jones, which is not really a site I adhere to, uh, there have been exactly 339 deaths attributed to mass shootings that have taken place on American soil since 2015. As Mother Jones notes in their database, they exclude shootings stemming from conventional crimes such as armed robbery or gang violence. In other, other news outlets and researchers have published larger tallies that include a wider range of gun crimes, as if guns cause crimes, in which four or more people have been either wounded or killed. While those larger data sets of multiple victim shooting, shootings may be useful for studying a broader problem of, quote, gun violence, which guns are not violent, they're just guns. Uh, our investigation provides an in-depth look at the distinct phenomenon of mass shootings from the firearms used to the mental health factors to the growing copycat problem. If we compare the 339 citizens killed in mass shootings to citizens killed by police in the same time frame, the comparison is off the charts. We're talking about 1,280% difference. That's a big difference. Already in 2019, American police have killed 488 people. This number is set to increase uh, by one on average every eight hours. Since 2015, cops have, in America have killed 4,355 citizens, and most people are not saying a god dang thing about it. All right, the, the article goes on and shows you a bunch of charts and data and information and such like that. And I suggest, uh, if you are interested in this topic, and it's hopefully you are, that maybe, possibly, you want to you check this out. But uh, do, not, do not skip out. Do not go lightly on the part uh, about when it talks about uh, the, those mass killers being on a variety of pharmaceutical drugs. Because it's a huge factor. Uh, so, uh, anyway, just, just take that for, for what it is, what it is, what it is. All right. I may go a little over. We'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I've been kind of rambling on, carrying on about things, so we, we may go a little bit over. We'll see. All right. Uh, from ZeroHedge.com, posted on July 16th there. I don't really have too much to say about this either. I think it's kind of evident from the title, but we'll give you a little. As Wall Street celebrates soaring stocks, companies are literally shutting down all over America. How long can the stock market possibly stay completely disconnected from economic reality? On Monday of that week, the Dow Jones Industrial rose by a mere 27 points, but that was good enough to push it over yet another new all-time record. Investors have been absolutely thrilled by extremely impressive bull run that we have witnessed so far in 2019. But there is no way that this is sustainable. Wall Street may be celebrating for the moment, but meanwhile, all of the hard, actual, real economic numbers are telling us that we have now entered a new economic slowdown. Just like in 2008, it appears to be in freaking evitable <laughs> that the party on Wall Street is about to hit a brick wall. The keg is tapped. But nobody should be surprised when that happens. Everywhere around us are signs of economic trouble. And right now, companies are literally, literally, literally shutting down all over America. For example, just take a look at what's happening in the trucking industry. This guy recently warned about the trucking bloodbath, which I think myself and Musker also warned about, that was unfolding, and over the past week, it has greatly accelerated. On the 12th of July, we learned that trucking giant LME had abruptly shut down. Yep, just boom, gone. And uh, <laughs> so that, that there went 424 truck drivers and... Uh, uh, a total of 600 men and women that, that op operated that company. Um, 
Also, we learned that day that Timmerman's Starlight Trucking suddenly shut down without any notice. You know, you can't really run a country without truckers. It just doesn't work. It's it's no good. It's it's not it's not something you can do. Uh, so the 40-year-old trucking outlet Timmerman's Starlight Trucking is the latest victim in the trucking apocalypse and announced it would be shutting down effective immediately. Uh, 30 employees are expected to lose their jobs. The company is based in a mid-sized city about 100 miles east of San Fran and has a fleet of 30 trucks, 150 trailers, 28 drivers. Anyway, it goes on here talking about various other companies that are shutting down. Uh, uh, Fred's Fred's is apparently a department store of some kind. I, I don't know. Anyway, show, closing 129 stores in 80 locations. Um... I, I don't know, Barney's on the cusp of filing for bankruptcy, whoever Barney's is. Uh, anyway, companies are shutting down. Just, 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 just be aware of that. Um, oh, okay, Vinny's going to do a show on Friday. Hooray. Cool. <laughs> now this story, this next story, I, I was going to share it with you. And I do want to share it with you. But I'm going to share it with you so that you could read it yourself because you need to, it takes time to understand how you, how your brain creates time. Time created by you. Not actually in existence in the real world. Anyway, from NewScientist.com, the time paradox, how your brain creates the fourth dimension. We all feel pa the passing of time, but nothing in physics suggests it is a fundamental property of the universe, because it's not. So where does our sense of time, the fourth dimension, uh, time's flow come from? And, and like I said, I, I, I do want to uh, share this with you, but, but what I want you to do is ponder it and read through it and understand it. Time is a, a construct that you create. Time is not real. But you need it in order to function in, 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 the, in, in, the daily, in your daily life because things happen. For example, this show that you're listening to now comes on at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's a time. It's a time at a particular place. And if I didn't know that time, I wouldn't be able to do my show on a scheduled basis and you would never know when to tune in to listen. So we need time to measure events in the physical world, but time doesn't act the same for everybody. If you ask the people, sometimes you think time's flowing by really fast, sometimes it's crawling. But if you look at it from a scale of some sort, such as a clock, you'll say, well, it's still moving at the same pace it always did. It's always, well, more or less, within, within a few nanoseconds, one way or the other. <laughs> but time, and we've talked about time a lot on Freaker's Ball, and, uh, and I think I've talked about it here on this show as well. Um, time is a funky thing. Time, time is very funky. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Do you think like your dog knows what time it is? Your dog doesn't know what time it is. <laughs> your dog doesn't understand when you when you walk out the door to go to the grocery store or whatever. Your dog has no idea what time you left, how long it's been. If would you return? It could have been a minute, could have been a day, could have been a week. They may know because they're hungry. And the, their hunger kind of drives that thing, but yeah, not really time. Anyway. <laughs> All right, we're going to close out with these two things here. Um, the first one is important for you to, to, to know about in the way that it could cause you problems if you happen to get this particular Trojan. Uh, and it's called Extend Bro. Don't extend me, bro. Uh, no, it's it's a DNS changer Trojan 
that protects adware. And so if you get this Trojan on your machine, the adware can change your DNS on you. It's, it's a, I'd, I'd say technical, but it's not really all that technical. Uh, either way, malware bytes put this uh, this out uh, some time ago. And if you have, if, and really, this is only for Windows users, by the way. Kate says her dog, Charlie, one of her dogs, Charlie, does know that it's 4 p.m. and it's his feeding time. <laughs> and Vinny says dogs do know what time. So maybe they got like the, uh, the, the dog time X or something going on there. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so if you get this, uh, like I said, it's only for Windows users that, well, this and most other viruses and are, are a problem. Um, <laughs> but if, if uh, th th this could also uh, occur on, on um, other machines, uh, but, but just check it out. The, uh, if you're not running a good virus, antivirus software, um, then you'll want to. And, you, and you'll, it, it should automatically take care of any Extenbro or other adware or virusware, malware that your machine gets. And it should also take care of ransomware, uh, which is the reason I bring up this next article, this next post to you. Not really an article so much as a listing of the 11 best free antivirus softwares of 2019. Now I run two different ones. I have two two Windows machines going, this computer and Barman's computer, both running on Windows, Windows 7. By the way, on this machine I run malware bytes, uh, and on my other machine I I, I run something called Komodo, uh, which is really really good. Um, but this this article here uh, goes through the ones, and you can make take your choices of of those uh, that are listed here and pick what you like. I personally tested every single application on this to see how well it would work on my machines and what kind of load it would put on the machines, how well uh, it, it found things, uh, what kind of time it would take, what kind of features it had. Like I said, there's 11 of them. And it goes through Avira, it goes to Bitdefender, uh, and it's a pretty good breakdown they give you here in this article too. Uh, AdAware, Antivirus, uh, Avast, which a lot of people like and use, uh, Panda Dome, which is eh, kind of outdated. Um, continue reading. Come on now. Uh, AVG, which I've used in the past and not really happy with at this point. Komodo, like I said, which is the one I'm using on my, my other computer, the Barman computer, uh, which is really, really good. Uh, and free, free. Uh, that, and that's, that's where malware bytes falls down. It's not free. You can use a, a, a free version for a short period of time, but it's not free. Uh, anyway, Forte Client, uh, Immunet Antivirus, uh, Kapersky, which is limited in its free version, but it's decent. Um, and uh, Zone Alarm, finally Zone Alarm, which a lot of people really do like. Um, but it, it, it is, it does put quite the bog on your system. It, it is quite uh, resource intensive. So if you're going to look at anything on this list and pick one out, um, if you're running Windows, a Windows, a version of Windows, I would suggest Komodo. But that's just my suggestion. And as I say, I, I go through, I test software all the time. And not for any company or any purpose, other than the fact that I want to know what works best. Uh, and at least for me. Whether it's going to work best for you or not, I don't know. But uh, so there it is, the 11 best free antivirus software of 2019. You'll notice Malware Bytes is not listed on there because, as I said, it is not free. However, if you come across a problem, sometimes I, the free version of Malware Bytes is the only thing that will get rid of it. So if you want to pay for the pro version on an annual basis, I think it's like 40 bucks. I'm not suggesting that you do with things like Komodo out there, which is very, very good. Uh, uh, but uh, if you want to, Malware Bytes is awesome. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for me here today. I'm about five minutes, four minutes over my time. Thank you all for tuning in so much. I'll be back again next week with another episode of Grim Leftovers. Uh, I don't know if Flash is coming on at this evening or not. If he does, he'll be on in six hours. Sometimes he rolls it around to the next day, so maybe he'll be on 
uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, or maybe he'll just skip this week. I don't know. Um, so that with his show in a perfect world. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, Grammy will be on um, Wednesday and Friday this week and next. And that will be it for Grammy's Rocket Chair, at least for a while. No, it's not K. Uh, no, it's C O M O D O. Komodo, Vinny. Um, <laughs> I know you're trying to be funny there, play on words, all that stuff, but. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so check out all the rest of the shows uh, here on uh, Real Liberty Media, RLM Radio. And uh, thank you so much. Really, I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great evening or morning, day, whatever. Peace! <laughs>